Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Um, very honored to be here. Very nice to meet you all. First time at the conference. Blue dot. Um, and what a wonderful presentation so far. I'm uh, thinking back immediately of what the first presenter uh, said in this session, which is we have to make sure that these tools are actually useful in helping people. And in the end, saving lives. And that's sort of what I'm hoping to get from this conference. Some feedback from all of you, this mix between academics and actual yeah, practitioners to see whether the tools that me and my colleagues have made are actually useful and what we might change to address them. Um, a little content overview. I'm here uh, funded by a project uh, that I'm involved in, so I'll talk a little bit about that and then the tools that I'm, I'm here to present. So the Paratus project, uh, they've been very nice in paying for my, my visit here. Um, it's a whole long name, but basically it's disaster risk preparedness uh, and providing the, the useful tools to do it. It's a Horizon Europe program with 19 partners in total, spread around Europe uh, with some case study also in the Caribbean. And then it wants to do uh, well, both information service and simulation services for uh, disaster risk reduction uh, practitioners. I'm uh, working mostly in the simulation service side, right? That's where I make these uh, modeling tools. And most of it is going to end up being web based tooling that is open, usually also open source to a certain extent. Um, and it feeds together, right? So you can do multi hazard risk assessments, uh, alternative scenarios, and, and things like that. And then to my little niche within that project, which is a, a flex simulation tool that, uh, that we've developed that I'd uh, love to show you. Basically, it's just like any other flood model, which might, might sound a bit boring, but I'll get to what's hopefully the interesting part. It's just really, really fast. It does all the things you would expect. Uh, precipitation, infiltration, runoff, uh, river, river flow, flooding, uh, reservoirs, etc. It's just really, really fast. Fast enough that you can do interactive mitigation sketching and immediately get back the results of your alternative scenario and what that is going to change in your flood maps. There's sort of two sides to the speed. One is that the model is fast. The other side is that we use a lot of global data sets so you can quickly set up and parameterize your model. Um, all of what you're going to see today is all free to run anyway. Um, and you can go there now. It's online, fastflow.org. If you want to visit, follow along. Uh, you can go there on your phone and that, that should be on your laptop. And it should be fine. It runs everywhere in principle. A little demo, just a screen recording that I uh, I made of me using. This is just a website, right? And I'm using in the tool some elevation data. I'm not using a global one here because I have, I have a better data set available. And this is part of Caribbean Island, Dominica, the catchment that leads to the capital. I'm specifying my, uh, my rainfall data. I'm integrating some global satellite-based uh, land cover information to feed information about where are the buildings, where is the forested areas, etc. And when I run the model, even though it's quite a big area with a resolution of five meter per grid cell within the simulation, it takes about four or five seconds and you immediately get your simulation results. That's fast enough that we can start to do interesting interactive stuff, right? Um, so what I'm doing next is sketching some kind of mitigation uh, in this case, a barrier to protect the stadium in the city and see if that's actually going to be useful. So again, I draw the mitigation, I press simulate, four or five, five seconds later, it's, uh, it's done and your results are there. Um, we can even go to higher detail. So here I'm loading an even higher resolution uh, elevation model just of the city itself, two and a half meters per pixel for those interested. And I'm using this refinement approach that we developed. And yeah, that takes all the hydrology and flood simulation from the, the catchment scale model that we've just done. It refines it to get more detail even in the street level. Uh, yeah, and visualize that for the user. There's a lot more to the tool, but I'm, I'm <laughs> going to try and keep it short. It also does things related to hydrology, discharge, and, and additional information. If you ask the model to output it, uh, it's going to do that for you. And then you can visualize things like uh, hydrographs uh, for your point of interest, 
the discharge routing that's estimated internally by the model, uh, things like that, right? There you go. I'm gonna talk a lot about uh, the calibration that we've done so far and, and, and the validation of the tool. And there's some, uh, some built-in exposure analysis as well. Um, so that's sort of the basic layout, right? Uh, some of you might have seen that earlier if, you, if you've seen me talk about the tool before. So the idea is it's just really, really fast and it's near identical in results to full traditional tools that typically take many hours, days, weeks to run, depending on your, your size of your area. Which is which I'm not able to tell myself. So that's basically the point of the slide. They're very, very similar, right? And, so far in all of the, the calibration and validation studies we've done, we see that we, we reach about 98, 99% accuracy in terms of flood extent, flood heights, uh, river water heights, et cetera. This is just comparing observations with some uh, full simulation for flash flooding and on the top left, some uh, this rapid tool that we developed. Now it's been out now for yeah, one and a half, two years which also gave a big transition because people wanted to actually start using it in practice. And that gave well, a whole other range of requests from the tool, right? We want to do this now with it. We want to do probabilistic stuff. We want, well, there's all kinds of different needs that you get then. Um, but we've, trying to, we've been trying to grow with that and, and adjust the tool. I do want to talk a little bit about the, the limitations and the assumptions that the tool like this makes, because those are important. And I'll, I'll get to that a bit later. So there's two primary things that the model does that you've seen. It only predicts the peak parameters. So flow height, peak velocity, time by nanny. That is one of the key ways in which it go fast. But it's also a limitation if you think you can you use a tool like this. The separate assumption that's there is that it separates in, in terms of its algorithms, the routing of the water and the floodplain inundation calculations. There's sort of four steps to the algorithm itself, um, some terrain correction, the reservoir detection. Step two is steady states discharge routing. You don't have steady states in nature, so you cannot use those directly. Instead, in step three, we correct for the fact that there's only a partial steady state for a real watershed, a river system, and an actual rainfall event. And then the fourth step takes the discharge predictions for the entire space and reconstructs the floodplain water heights. Now that's kind of nice because we use all, well, sometimes we use all the steps, but you can also skip the first three, not let the model do the hydrology and, and, and data correction. You can also just give it a discharge boundary condition. And then you just use step four, right? I know already what discharge I'm going to have, and I'm going to let step four do the uh, inundation map for me. How it works uh, is a long story. I'll refer you to the paper or come to my market booth uh, later today. Um, what we use is uh, what, yeah, what we've sort of been calling exponentially scaling uh, uh, prof profile cross-section approximations that are calculated on the fly within the elevation model and the channel information that it gets from the global data sets. And that method has been working really well, looking at stage discharge relationships in two rivers in the Netherlands and Nepal, we got excellent accuracy compared to traditional industry standard methods in that sense. Now, in the original um, study, we, we compared it for four different areas, some Caribbean, some Alps, some Tajikistan, some Netherlands, uh, mostly focusing on flood extent there. And yeah, there as well, we saw that accuracy that we, we reached being 98, 99% uh, uh, of the traditional models, right? It's, uh, yeah, same banal equations, basically, which have been the industry standard for a long time. So now a little bit more into applications that we've done since then. What you see here is a couple images um, taken from a city called Falkenberg. This is a small touristic city in the south of the Netherlands. And like more cities in, uh, in that region, it was impacted quite heavily during the 2021 uh, European floods. And what you see here is uh, some of the impacts, right? Water uh, in all of the streets. And on the top right, you see the actual historic center with the Gull River there and uh, the aftermath of the, of the event. Quite a surprising event for water managers in, uh, in this region. 
But what we were able to do there was set up a uh, yeah, pre-calibrated model for them that basically simulates the entire area. Well, okay, it matches very well with the observations of the, uh, of the event in 2021. But now this also can function in two ways, right? It's sort of a hazard map. They can use it to refer to, uh, to areas that are in there. Yeah, have a, have a hazard or not. But they can also use it through this interactive mitigation sketch. And that is something that's really, really been powerful. So if you talk to decision makers, if you talk to urban planners, you give them a flood modeling tool that they can change interactively and get the results in a couple of seconds. That sparks so many ideas. If you set them around the table uh, and immediately they start drawing ideas and, and seeing the consequences of that, that's been really amazing to, uh, to see. Another use that we've been asked to do quite a lot is, is rapid assessment work. So you had uh, last year's summer in Derna, Libya, the, uh, the flood disaster, which was a flash flash with some, some dam breaking there as well. And we got some, uh, some satellite imagery. And the question, yeah, can you, can you model this event now? Can you say something more about the hydraulics and the, the water behavior? And yeah, we could, right? So even with global data sets, having nothing else, uh, it takes about one and a half seconds to run the model, two minutes for me to set it up, calibrate it based on the data that we have uh, uh, visually. Um, and you could even do that with, with Sentinel open data, right? So there's a lot of opportunities to do things like that and also go to what if scenarios. So on the other side of the country, there was also a small reservoir at the point of breaking. So we could quickly say, well, with all of these calibrated settings I now have, let me go to the other side of the country and do a what-if scenario there. And we then did something similar in Kazakhstan. Um, so actually, so this is uh, near a city called Peshawar, north of Kazakhstan. And it's, it, the Isham River that, that well, flows there is, uh, is, is quite long. So already uh, five days before, you could see the flood wave was there upstream. So we got high-resolution satellite imagery. We didn't get discharge measurements. They, those weren't available for that particular location at that moment. But we were able to calibrate the model quickly based on upstream uh, visible flood extent and then use those calibrated settings to apply the model downstream to where the city was. And what you see here in the red outlines is the observed flood extent and then blue is the flood depth prediction by uh, uh, fast flood. Don't mind the, the top left corners. We didn't have the uh, elevation data there. We, we bought some commercial satellite-based elevation data. Uh, so we only predicted within the bounds of the data. <laughs> and things like dam outbreak scenarios, right? Something that's especially computationally intensive to do is something that becomes, uh, yeah, you can do in a matter of seconds. Um, there's quite a lot of trickiness to that in terms of the uncertainty. So usually we take a probabilistic approach there within the tool, but still that's been functioning uh, rather well, right? So we, we base the peak discharges from the, uh, uh, yeah, sort of the, the reservoir catastrophe on historical analysis of uh, yeah, historic dam and reservoir break events. And then from that, we use different quantiles to do the, uh, the probabilistic element. And this is an example of what you get when you do that. So this is the border between Kazakhstan and Russia, um, near the city of Orsk, where there were some troubles related to, uh, to reservoir outflow and, uh, and embankments near the city as well. Comparing again, the model with the observed flood outlines in that. There's a lot more we want to add to the tool. We're in the process of adding. We have a big update plan. One of them is uh, going to include the full dynamics. Uh, it's also directly in your web browser, not just being able to do the, the, the rapid model that I've shown you, but also doing the full dynamics, like a traditional model would, with different tricks to speed it up, not as fast as I've, what I've shown you before. But it's something that's useful, right? And yeah, what I said, we do this, this probabilistic approach then for, uh, for, for dam break scenarios. Uh, here you see different quantiles, right? The median quantile scenario, 95% uh, quantile scenario for the same region in uh, Tunisia. And in the end, we can use that to do hazard classification from uh, the fast flood modeling results. 
And again, what, what I mentioned for decision makers, uh, for people that are in emergency management, uh, we've added some functionality and, and they've, yeah, we've had some good feedback from people saying that we're really enjoying the practical use of this tool and that, that interactivity. Coastal floods is there as well. You can set coastal boundary conditions also linked with global data sets. Um, I should say we link both in, in global data sets for precipitation. So you can automatically load design storm events with a specified return period for the area that you were modeling. We also provide climate change uh, scenarios built in for any area in the world based on the CMIP-6 ensembles. And we also have design storm events or design events for coastal boundary conditions indicated as well. And since we're here, <laughs> a student uh, that I supervised this year was working on uh, uh, flood hazard assessment in Nairobi and then using AI assist tools to uh, yeah, increase the accuracy specifically for slums, which is a difficult area to predict flood hazard for, since it depends so much on the intricate details of water management that you don't have data for, especially not in global data sets. So they are doing a bit of a comparison with different models and also validating with, uh, with field surveys uh, that were done in the end. So bringing this back together a little bit, we've, we've made this tool. Um, it does, yeah, flash floods, blue field floods, blue field coastal, which has been really nice. Um, it's super fast. We get near identical accuracy to full models, but there is a caveat. <laughs> Well, it's easy to use, right? It's easy to find, it's easy to input something and model, but it's also very easy to misuse. And that's something that we've been really also struggling with in the sense you want to, <laughs> well, we make training materials available on the website, right? We make tutorials on YouTube, sure. At least I try to do with the time that I have, but most people go there and they just use it, which is also a dangerous thing, right? Um, these are technical tools. You have to know the limitations somewhat. Uh, it's not completely, uh, uh, as a carefree in its use. You can learn it pretty quickly, but still you have to, you have to think a little bit about how you use it. And uh, I think that's something that, uh, yeah, bringing sort of the responsibility of using such a tool to everybody is something that needs a lot of clear communication in that sense. There's a lot of other tools we, we want to add, things like 3D visualization, uh, better data for, for a lot of things. Um, I won't bore you too much with this. I'm more interested in feedback from you, so things that you might think are cool, things that you, things that you might think uh, might be improved and what you want to see added. So please drop by the booth at the marketplace. And final slide. Um, there's another tool that we've made as well, uh, fastslide.org, so this is specifically focusing with the same principles, using global data sets for model setup, and using these, uh, yeah, these, these algorithms for the rapid simulation, but then focusing on uh, landslide behavior. And then they also interact, which is where you get the multi-hazard components that, we, uh, that we're really aiming to get at. Um, thank you so very much uh, for having me, and, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Bastian. Um, any questions? Many questions. Yes, I have a question. Can we use this operationally as well? And, and if so, I, I implement it, for example, in an early warning system? Yeah, thank you for your question. Very, very good one. One of the things that we, I think I added it to the list, we, we want to get to is, is early warning stuff, right? And um, the website is not an operational tool. You, sh you shouldn't, uh, really. Uh, that's not what it's meant for. We have also a more operational thing of the, the model. So just a you know, package you can, you can run locally and, and more operationalize and automate, which is almost ready. If you're interested, let me know. It's possible, but uh, early days, right? Yeah. I saw a second question. <laughs> Uh, thanks. It's a really good presentation. So I noticed your models are outputting peak flood. How do you validate credibly um, against, say, flood extents or you know uh, velocities, depths, and the rest? Because the maps do look really good. But how do I know that what I'm looking at is actually credible? And can you just speak on the quantitative metrics? Because it's pretty much been qualitative. Or this looks nice. This looks. Pretty similar to across outputs, and at times you're validating 
against model outputs again. So just can you speak to that a bit? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the excellent question. So um, I fully agree with you. It's just like any other model. And like any other model, you want to calibrate and validate it before you use it in any any means that any decision making, right? Um, I think it is a little bit less sensitive. So typically it doesn't have, yeah, it, it, it behaves a bit better in calibrate, I would say, than other models in, in, in many cases, but still it's it's required. We've calibrated on, on different parameters, flood extents, we've calibrated on flood depths, flood velocities, um, uh, surveys that were done with point locations. Um, so basically, when you, yeah, I think five different types of, of data we've calibrated the model in different regions. So I can say for sure that it, it, it's able to perform accurately with different types of, uh, of validation data. For users, um, at the moment, there is a little bit of calibration support there. Like it can auto automatically calibrate for you. If you give it some observational data, it will just do its thing and give you calibrated model as an output. So it automates that for you. Um, but getting your own validation data, that you have to do yourself, right? That's not in, uh, in the global data sets that we link. I hope that answers your question. So one more question. Yeah, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, actually, uh, looking at uh, the nature of the model, uh, and if you have any focus on particular basin, uh, do you consider inputting operation of certain reservoir into the model? Because that's, that's one factor that also could trigger floods, uh, even without the natural inflow, like uh, hydropower and irrigation, which also allows water to drain downstream. Do you consider that? Uh, like for River Niger, it has different regime, black and white floods, in addition to some of these factors at operational level to dumps. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for your question. Uh, definitely. So in the website right now, you can input reservoirs, you can input, uh, yeah, like a, a water management at a, at a river level that's been implemented. Um, if you want to operationally feed your own reservoir outflow data into the tool, then you don't want to use the website. Um, we're probably going to publish like the operational tool soon, maybe end of calendar year. But if you want to want to have a chat about it, let me know. Yeah, but there it's definitely possible. You just provide it as a as a value and the mobile uses. Thank you. 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 Thank